Romans 12, he said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let me read it to you from another translation. The New Living says, verse 2, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by, by changing the way you think. Did you hear that phrase? Let God transform you into a new person. How's he going to do it? We're involved in the process yes, we by us changing the way we think. Yes, yes. Is it true that if you change the way you think, you change you? Yes. Yes. That's exactly right. God changes you. He's the one that gave you the right thoughts, mm -hmm. the right words and the right thoughts to think. And then you and I made the choice to think them and change our way of thinking. And it'll cause you to become a different person. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. How many in this place and, and outside the place watching by the internet and other means, you uh, are interested in knowing the will of God. Yes. Knowing what is exactly that, that good and and, and well-pleasing and perfect will of God yes. for your life. Yes. Well, he's telling us how to know it, right. isn't he? Yes. If the, us knowing and being established in the perfect will of God for our life is connected to mind renewal. Yes. And I think it'd be safe to say that we're not going to find and know the will of God, the perfect will of God, without our minds being renewed. Because he said, this is how it happens. So should we be interested in our minds getting renewed? People uh, sometimes talk about churches like us and go, man, watch out, don't go over there, they'll brainwash you. Well, in fact, your brain needs a real good scrub. <laughs> And we know just exactly what to, how to do it. It is the washing of the water of the Word. Yes. And depending on what you do and how much in the world and how much of the world you're seeing and hearing, it is defiling. It is contaminating. And that's one of the reasons we need to come together and have the Word wash over us. And it's why you need to open up your Bible at home and read your chapter and other things and wash, let, let the washing of the water of the Word cleanse your spirit and your mind. We need it. And in that washing process is renewing. You're washed, you're renewed, you're refreshed, invigorated, yes. excited about tomorrow. Yes. Now you hang around the wrong stuff and listen to the wrong thing, you'll feel weighted down, heavy, sad, hopeless, powerless, victim. Hmm? Which means you better get out of there. <laughs> and get somewhere where you can hear something else. That's why you need faith buddies and faith friends that will not talk the junk and failure and defeat and impossibility and hopelessness of the world, but they'll talk faith to you. They'll talk Bible expectation. They'll talk excitement about the future. 
You know, you can take that uh, looking forward to the future another step. In just a few more breaths, we're out of here <laughs> to heaven. That's real. That's not a fairy tale. That's not imaginary. That's real. And uh, this is, you know, this is all we've ever done. So we think, you know, 50 years, 100 years is a long time. It's not. The Bible said it's, it's like a rose that blooms and then it's gone. That's what our life is like. It may seem long to us, but that's how it's really like. Anybody deal with flowers? How long does a bloom last? That's our life. He said it's like a vapor. It's like a mist. It's like a morning fog. There it is. Then it evaporates. It's gone. Sun comes out. It's gone. That's your life. That's my life. But it's not the end. This was just faith school. <laughs> Preparation and training for the future because we're going to rule and reign with Him forever. We're going to be with Him forever. We're going to be with each other forever. You know, you're going to meet your great, 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 grandpa and grandma that you never even knew existed. And you're going to like them. You got family there. The family of God. All of them is your family. It's going to be amazing. So we can, we can endure these little trials and tests here. And the, the, the afflictions, are, they're not even worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. Can you make it a few more days and, and do, do some work for the Lord and have some victories and then get out of here? I mean, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Well, we, we're talking about finding and doing the will of God. And in order to do that, this passage says, mind renewal is connected to it. Today's English version says it like this, do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world. You ever heard of peer pressure? It's talked about a lot concerning a school junior high and high school, college. People talk about how, how terrible the peer pressure is. Peer pressure don't go away when you graduate. <laughs> peer pressure, so-called, is just simply a manifestation of the pressure that's in the world to make you like itself. Why is there so much pressure to conform? Everybody else was trying it. You're the oddball if you don't try it. Everybody else was wearing, back in my day, bell bottoms and <laughs> big collars and platform shoes, and afros if you could. <laughs> There's, there's this pressure to conform and, and, and the, the shades and designs and all that change, all the, they're continuously changing, but the pressure remains. Don't be an oddball. Don't be the last one on your block to have one. <laughs> Don't be the last one to participate. Don't be the last one to experiment. Why the pressure? We need mind renewal. We are different. Yes. We are different. Yes. We're supposed to be different. Yes. And you, they're, they're supposed to rise up in you and I when the world pushes us to conform to sin, to unrighteousness, to ungodliness. Something ought to rise up in us. Yes. And, and, and you know, don't rebel against God. Don't rebel against your, your leaders. Don't rebel against your, your parents. Rebel against that. Rise up against that and go, no. Well, everybody else is wearing short skirts. 
Everybody else is doing this drug. Everybody else is doing that. Everybody else is doing that. No, they're not. No, they're not. There's a lot of folks like us. There's millions of people like us. Now, there's billions of people on the planet, and I know that, but there's, we're, there's not just two or three of us. But even if it was, we're not supposed to conform. We are to be non-conformists. We are transformers. <laughs> not conformers. Pressure is the right word. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm referring to the scripture. Look at it again. What did it say, verse 2? What did it say? Don't conform. Did he say don't conform? Yes. Then what should we do? Conform. Don't conform. Anytime you feel anything pressuring you, and that's what it is. The, the word conform literally means to fashion alike. It means to conform to the same pattern. The devil, the spirit of the world, and ungodly people, pressure is coming from that to make you a cookie cutter copy of them. And we don't have to do that. Do we? We're not like them. We're born again. We're the people of God. We're different. We're supposed to be different. And we don't have to make apologies for it. We're not the ones that's wrong. <laughs> People that don't know God need to know God. We, we don't need to go their way. They need to come our way. And if they don't see it and they don't believe it, it's sad. But we're not going to help them by allowing them to pressure us into conformity and hide our, our faith, hide our believing in prosperity, hide our believing in faith, hide our speaking in tongues. No. They need to talk in tongues. Everybody on the planet should be a tongue talker. Everybody should be a faith in Jesus, walking by faith, authority in the name of Jesus, binding and loosing, talking in tongue, Christian. Surely, preacher, you're not so narrow-minded as to say that everybody should be like you all. I'm not, cultures vary. We're not supposed to go try to westernize the world. And that's not the same as evangelism. And a lot of uh, what people think is Christianity is their traditions that they've developed. And we need to separate tradition from the Word. But we, we must not let the pressure to conform bend us and mold us and shape us into a carbon copy of the unsaved, ungodly world. We're different. We're not like them. We're not supposed to be like them. Part of our job is to not be like them. They need to see something different. They need to see a different way to live, a different way to operate, and different or to be in front of their face every time we come through. I'm not talking about trying to be weird, trying to draw attention to yourself. I'm not talking about that. I'm just being who you are, just being a child of God and not apologizing for it, not being ashamed of it, letting your light shine. Everybody with me? What did the Bible say? Don't, don't be conformed. Don't conform yourselves. But he went on to say, but let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of mind. 
The, the emphasis in the, in the original language, the best I can tell, in this word transformation, it, it means uh, metamorphose. It's uh, the, the, what happens with a caterpillar to a butterfly is the exact picture of it. And it is to change into something else, to change into another form. Now, the world is trying to conform you to be like everybody else. But God would transform you into a different person. <laughs> and I, I believe this really is a missing link with a whole lot of Christians that come and they get born again and they get saved. And they hear about the power of the new birth. But then they are surprised and disappointed when immediately thereafter they're still dealing with some of the same issues. The next week and the next month and six months later as they were before they got saved and they kind of assumed that getting born again was going to take care of all this. But no. When you got born again, your mind didn't get born again. Your, your spirit, the man, the, the spirit part of your being became a new creation in Christ Jesus. But you had the same mind, right. same body, mm -hmm. didn't you? Yes, and so immediately after being born again, the word tells us we got to do something with our minds. Yes, right. We must take responsibility for getting them renewed. Yes, because especially if you live for any length of time on the earth before you got born again, well, your whole mindset has been conformed to an ungodly, worldly way of thinking. And you don't even notice it because everybody around you thinks the same way. And people call that normal thinking. But it's conformist. And when you start thinking like the Lord told you to think, it's going to raise a couple eyebrows. And you go far enough, people are going to look at you and go, well, who do you think you are? Because <laughs> it is so different from the way they think. Yes. Don't be conformed, but let God transform you. Transform means to become different, to undergo a change in form, to change into another form. That's why these other translations bring out a com, uh, let God transform you inwardly. You become something different. Even after you're born again, you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. But people that knew you the day before are going to see a very similar looking person. And you, and you will retain a lot of your ways. If you'll pay attention to your heart, wrong ways will bother you now. Things will bother you now that didn't used to bother you. And so we need to get on a, a continuous diet of the Word of God, feeding God's thoughts into us. And every time one of His thoughts shows up a wrong way of thinking, we're to reject that old way of thinking and embrace His way of thinking. And if we'll do that, the Bible says we will be changed into another person. Do you believe this? Do you want to be changed? And that the person, the, the, the other person that you're changed into is the Christ-like person because you're thinking like Him. And this, the, this is the amazing thing. We, we haven't emphasized this enough. This is transformative power to change you. What about the billions of dollars and the countless hours and effort and training and education that human beings are going through trying to change themselves and trying to change each other and trying to get things changed and people that are uh, in terrible habits and, and terrible practices, we got, we've got to get them changed. We've got to get them changed. And even Christians have made mistakes. By thinking that prayer would take care of everything. 
Well, I've prayed for them and prayed for them and prayed for them and they still had not changed. Prayer's wonderful, but you can't ignore the Word of God that says you've got to get your mind renewed. Unless we and they do something by it to change our minds and to change our way of thinking, we will not change. We will not be permanently changed. We've got to do something with our minds. The Lord did something with our spirit when we were born again. So now we've got the power. We can do something with our minds. But he's not going to control our mind for us. That's our mind. We have to do something with it. Are you willing to? Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Renewing. Renewing. Restoring. You know, the word transform is used in another couple of places. Mark 9, you don't have to turn there, but put it up on the screen for us. Mark 9 and 2. This same word, this transform, uh, transform is used here concerning Jesus when he took Peter and James and John and he took them up in the mountain apart and he was transfigured before them. That's the same word. Transfigured. It's translated transformed in Romans. Verse 3. Verse 3, his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. He changed right in front of them. They saw what was inside come out. And they saw something different than what they'd been looking at. Is it true that this there's a glorious possibility of this kind of transfiguration beginning to happen in us. Yes. It's the same word. It's the same word. Can you say glory to God? Go to 2 Corinthians, the third chapter. Transformed by the renewing of your mind. There's been wrong thinking in this. I've heard more than one person say, I wish I could just turn this thing off. God, the Holy Ghost, just take me over. I've heard people pray and cry. Oh, God, you know, just, just take me over and, and push my mind out of the way. And just, just you know, you're talking about a possession. That's what demons do. I just want the Holy Ghost to just possess me and take me over. And, and, and make me think right. And, and make, it's never going to happen. He's not a devil. He doesn't want to make you do something you don't want to do. You have to yield yourself to him willingly, voluntarily. And he's not going to control your mind. That's one of the things, uh, unique things about us. God has made us. Uh, nobody can force us to think what we don't want to think. We have total autonomy. We have freedom to choose what we want to think and choose what we want to say. That makes us speaking spirits in the God class. I know folks don't like to hear things like that, but we need to understand it. Are you not made in the likeness and image of God? This is a big part of what makes us that way. We can think Anything we choose to think. And we can say it. And we can believe it. And that's God-like. That's how God operates. Himself. And we must take seriously what thoughts are. Thoughts, you know, we've been talking about words on Sunday mornings. And, and thoughts and words go together. Because what is a, a word? A word is a thought capsule. A word means nothing unless it conveys thoughts. And so th these are closely connected. And one of the biggest problems is folks not taking seriously thoughts. Not even thinking about that they're significant. But every thought came from somewhere. Every thought. 
When we immerse ourselves in a book or a movie or a show or a conversation, the inspiration for the script or for the storyline or for the, where did it come from? You know, I know I, I got a revelation as a boy having to read certain literary works in school. They had us read Edgar Allan Poe's work. <laughs> Even had us memorize some of it, you know. Thus quoth the raven. What did the raven say? Nevermore. Nevermore. Never and even as a young teenage Christian, I decided Poe had devils at his house. <laughs> Poe needed to get saved and get delivered, man. But see, all these folk think, oh, it's great literary work because it's written with elaborate prose. We should have enough sense to not be razzle-dazzled by the prose and see where the spirit of it is coming from. Yes. See, the devil is taking the world to hell with window dressing. It's flashy, it's bright, it's this, it's that, it's art. <laughs> and so people ooh and ah and, and say, all this is world conformity. So-called experts, ooh and ah, and you looked at it and saw some crazy squiggles, but you don't want to be an outcast, so, so you read books and, and you look at it long and hard and you decide, yeah, I see some depth in there. And you're a phony and a conformist. If you don't see anything but squiggles, that's what you say. Out of squiggles. You just have no eye for art. <laughs> and who made you an expert? That's right. Hmm? Uh -huh. Who wrote the book that gave you the edge? Uh -huh. What devil inspired them? <laughs> <laughs> just because somebody writes an 800 volume page with a hard cover and has nine letters at the end of their name doesn't mean they know a thing. What spirit inspired them? Where did it come from? Is it life or death? Is it light or darkness? Is it joy or sorrow? If it's from God, it's good. It's perfect. It's life. It's freedom. It's joy. It's peace. That's art. There is no greater artiste than the creator. God, he made you. He made me one of a kind originals. Let him tell you what's art. You know what he'll tell you? Stay away from that death. Stay away from that confusion. Stay away from that perversion. I don't care if the whole world calls it art and wonderful. Have enough sense to know it's death. Where, where it came from. What it is. Don't be a conformist. Don't care if the whole world's raving over it. And they're handing out medals and accolades. And, and, and if you need to say it, you say it. That's depressing. <laughs> I don't have depressing stuff at my house. Oh, well, he has no eye for art. Don't be conformed. Don't be conformed. Don't be conformed. Tell your neighbor, help him out right now. Look at him and say, don't be conformed. Don't be conformed. Don't be conformed. The waves of what's cool, what's great, is changing all the time. Look back over a little bit of history. What's, you know, what was all the rage the world over 100, 200 years from now? You can't find it now. You know, what, what do you think about what's going on right now? What's it going to be in a little while? But the things of God 
never change. And they're always good. They exist forever. Can you say amen? amen. Glory to God. What was I talking about before I got, <laughs> got off into all that? Huh? Tell me again. 2 Corinthians 3, that's right. You guys are sharp. <laughs> Romans 8. I want us to get to this passage in Corinthians. That third and fourth chapter has a wealth of light and truth on this subject. But for right now, Romans 8 and uh, 4. Let's talk some more about this. What is a thought? What is a thought? I would, I would encourage you. Uh, I would exhort you. Not just tonight, but tomorrow, the next day, next week, next month. Think about that one simple question. What is a thought? We've had them ever since we can remember that we were cognitive and aware, self-aware. But what is it? What is it? Just because you're familiar with something doesn't mean you understand the significance of it. <coughs> Take oxygen, for instance. We take it for granted, right? But how did it get here? What is it? Where did it come from? And some people got all these theories, well, the cosmos and the explosion and this. Okay, if it happened that way, where did it come from to get to there? <laughs> what is a thought? I'm, I'm encouraging you, meditate on that one simple question tonight, tomorrow, the next day, as we go through this series. Just in the middle of a Tuesday, just say, what is a thought? What is, what is a thought? Thoughts are much more significant than we have thought. <laughs> what is a thought? A thought is spiritual. It's not natural. Can you touch a thought? No. You can't feel a thought. Now, a thought can affect feelings and result in feelings, but the thought itself, you didn't feel it. What is a thought? Where did it come from? What exactly is a thought? There are some thoughts, come on now, think with me. There, there are some thoughts, you can just be going along, not happy, not sad, not anything, and think of that thought and just make you happy. Maybe it's your grandbaby. Maybe what, whatever it is, something they did, something that happened, or something that you're about to get to see them, you're about to get to do things, that thought comes to you, and I mean immediately, instantaneously, it makes you feel different yeah. than you did a millisecond before, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Yeah. It's transformative. Mm -hmm. It's powerful. There are other thoughts that make people break out into a cold sweat yeah. and start to shake and tremble. Nothing happened to them physically. It was a thought of what they're about to go through or what, to, what could happen to them or a thought. Thoughts can bring you, uh, you know, make you happy and, and full of joy. Thoughts can terrify you. They're powerful, powerful things. What are they? Where do they come from? How did they how did they exist? How did they get to your mind? And as, as we answer that question, we'll begin to realize we must take responsibility for what thoughts we let ourselves think. Yes. We, we, we must stop this just letting anything rattle around our mind that happens to come through. Yes. In uh, Romans 8, 
Romans 8 and 5, they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. The mind is the connector. The mind is the connector. Hold your place here, go to Hebrews, fourth chapter. I know I'm going slowly, but we need to. We need to because this is not something we've necessarily, a lot of people have spent a lot of time in. And so there's no need, I know there's no need to talking about multiplication and you had not got addition, That's you know. Right. <laughs> we got to get, get, get first things first. Uh, Hebrews 4 and verse 12, for the word of God is quick. Now the word quick means life living and life giving. Quick is alive. Quickening is life giving, life imparting. The word of God is quick. How many know it is both of those? The word of God is living and the word of God is life giving. It is quick and it is powerful. How many believe it is powerful? Yes. What is a word of God? <laughs> well, the word of God has been written in Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, Italian, French, Portuguese, on and on and on and on. And a lot of those words, if you heard them, wouldn't mean a thing to you. Hmm? Yeah. So what is a word? Including a word of God. The word of God, though it is wrapped in Portuguese words and French words or English words for us, it's the same thoughts. If the word is the correct word, it's a capsule that contains the same thought that he uttered when he uttered it in the first language. But I don't believe God is limited to Hebrew. Hmm. What did he speak 10 billion years ago? He speaks everything. How many ways could he say it? We don't have that long to discuss it. But it's not the letters that form the English word or whatever the word, it's the thought. Yes. So we're really talking about his thoughts, yes. aren't we? The psalmist said, oh God, your thoughts are so precious to me. Would you say the same thing? Yes. What could a thought of God do for you? What is a thought of God? God tells you, I had a thought about you. And I want to tell you about it. What would that thought, would it just be information? Or is it alive and life-giving and powerful? God had a thought. And so he said it. Light be. Before he said it, it was in him. Wasn't it? There is nothing more creative, more transformative, more powerful than God's thoughts. And we got a book full of them. <laughs> a book full of his thoughts. And his desire for us is that we immerse ourselves and think his thoughts night and day until we begin to think like him. And as we begin to think like him, we are transformed into being like him. Glory to God. And this is our eternal future. 
for the rest of our existence. God is going to share more and more of his thoughts with us. And we're going to see things and we're going to know things. and We're going to understand and comprehend the vastness of God. We're going to know and understand and comprehend and experience the height and the breadth and the depth, the length, the whole love of God who is love. This gets too big to talk about, don't it? <laughs> and yet, this is not in vain. You know what all of us are doing that are awake and paying attention? <laughs> Our minds are on the same place. You and I and all of we're sharing these thoughts, same thoughts at the same time. Remember the book of Acts talking about when they all got in one place, one mind, one accord. Some of the most amazing things happen. <laughs> glory to God. Somebody say glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Everybody lift up a hand and say it out loud, Lord. I love your thoughts. I love, your thoughts. I love your words, I love your words. That, contain that contain your thoughts with all my heart. All my heart. They, are they are precious to me. They're more valuable to me, valuable to me than, silver than silver and gold, than any amount of money. They are, they are life itself. I yearn, I, yearn. I, seek, I seek to know your thoughts. Know your thoughts. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Mm -mm. The Word of God is alive and life-giving and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. We have been woefully ignorant of what we are. I guess most Christians on the planet think they're mind and body. Or if they acknowledge their spirit, they're not aware of it. It's just a, a oh, I'll let the word escape me. It's a position of belief. But you're not just a body, you're a spirit. You have a mind that's eternal. If your body fell dead right now, wouldn't change you. You'd still be you. You'd still have your mind. You just would no longer be restricted <laughs> and limited. And even though we take your body, they embalm it or cremate it or bury it or whatever, that's not the end of that body. I don't care if, it, if you died out in the desert and your bones bleached to dust and the buzzards got you and everything, the coyotes and everything else, and, and then what remained will turn to dust and, and blew to the four corners of the earth over the next 500 years. When the trumpet sounds, <laughs> God knows where every atom Every molecule is. And it's going to come back together. And the glory of God is going to flow through it. And it's going to become immortal and incorruptible. You really believe that? Absolutely. Yes. That's what's going to happen. And then you're going to slip back in your body like a brand new pair of shoes. And you and I are going to have it all. We're going to have a body that could keep up with our spirit. 
We will be able to go at the speed of light and do 9,000 things at the same time and never get tired and never get weary, never have a wrinkle or a gray hair or a sore spot. What that's going to be like. What that's going to be It's just a few breaths away from us. We're so close to it. Makes you happy to think about it. It's a thought. See, God gave us the, we wouldn't even know to, we're thinking about that. Did that make you happy just now? Okay. That thought did something to you and for you. We wouldn't have even know that thought except it's in here. And the Lord said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. If it wasn't so, I would have told you. And I'm going to come back and get you. And Revelation gives us some detail about it. And, and, and epistles tell us about, we're going to have a body like to His glorious body. We're just putting all that together and sharing these thoughts. But we wouldn't, we wouldn't know to think that. Wouldn't know to conceive that. Unless He had given us that thought. He gave it to us. There are thoughts that are true. There are thoughts that are lies. These thoughts are true. He said, This word, sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Your soul and spirit is not the same. Some theologians teach that it is, it's not. And the scripture shows you plainly uh, a way to understand it. I'm, I'm believing for more understanding of spirit and soul. I've heard some things that popular teaching that doesn't satisfy me. And uh, the word, if you've done much study on it, the word pneuma and the word suke, you can come away after nine hours scratching your head. <laughs> it's because it's used so many different ways. Seems, and this has to do with the translators. But anyway, we're, we, we are spirit and we, we have a soul and we have mind. And the Bible tells us that the word pierces to the dividing. The word can pierce uh, and divide soul and spirit. Mm -hmm. If it can be divided, it must not be exactly the same. Right. And of the joints and marrow. And to me, this is a picture of soul and spirit. Yes. Yes. Why would he use this right together with it? Joint and marrow is a picture of soul and spirit. Well, you could see why they, uh, it could be uh, challenging if you hadn't, the Lord hadn't given you much revelation about it to understand because joint and marrow is close. Yes. Isn't it? <laughs> joint and marrow. That's the way soul and spirit is. And so, with that in mind, go back to Romans 8. And notice this. The joint and the marrow are touching each other, aren't they? Are they connected? Are they touching? And yet they're not the same. Uh, Romans 8 tells us to be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be carnally minded is death. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. They that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. To be carnally minded is death. Does it matter what you let yourself think on? Yeah. Or is it true that there are thoughts that will absolutely minister death to you? Yeah. Another way of saying it, kill you. Yeah. Are there thoughts that will kill you? Now, sometimes people might say, well, no, I mean, just because you think something don't mean you're going to die. A lot of stuff, let's talk about a lot of stupid stuff that people did and they're no longer with us. Uh -huh. Why'd they do it? They had a thought. This crazy thought came into their mind. They didn't think it through. They just acted on that thought and they're not here anymore. So, did that thought have anything to do with killing them? Yeah. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life 
and peace. Read that out loud with me, please. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Minded means what you keep on your mind, what you think. They're carnal, natural, fleshly things and things inspired by the unsaved world and the devil that just minister death to you. And there are the words that God has given us that contain his thoughts and just thinking them changes you. Do you believe that you can think the word of God and it change you? While you're thinking it, it's changing you. What did our text say? Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Will it change you to think on what God said to you? We, we need to, the, the, our mind's being renewed right now. That while we're thinking on what he told us, we're changing right then. We're changing internally. And if we'll keep doing it, it'll show up on the outside. How many know the caterpillar was changing on the inside before you saw the butterfly? And that's me and you. Go to Matthew, please, the 18th chapter. I had the privilege of working in Brother Kenneth Hagin's healing school for a number of years and uh, ministering to people who a lot of them were pronounced terminal, hopeless, and they came there as a last resort looking for a miracle. And we saw some amazing things. And uh, we also saw some people that didn't receive. And uh, I know one thing that frustrated me in the early days was there were more than one case. I saw this over and over again. We had classes in the morning and in the afternoon. So people that came and just gave themselves to it, they would get like three or four hours of word every day. And praise and worship and prayer. And uh, sometimes there were additional things to that. A lot of times I gave them assignments too when they went home to, to read and confessions and things to do. And there were people that came in that they're breathing so loud and laboring so hard to breathe or even sit up straight. You could hear them all over the room and were so pale and were struggling so much. Some of them were on machines and some of them brought things in with them to, to sustain them that you wonder, are they going to make it through the service? They look like they could just stop breathing and just quit just any moment and later on find out the doctors said maybe they should have been, they expected them to, to be dead two or three weeks ago or or whatever. And I saw some of these same people like a flower in the sunshine sit there and the Word of God just come into them and then just soak. And, I, and I've seen sometimes uh, not everything change the first day or two or, or three, but some of them come stay with us two weeks, three weeks, a month. And I'd see some folks uh, sometimes just in five days of three or four hours of Word a day just look totally different. They're breathing good. They're standing up talking to you. Their color is good. Now all their symptoms are not gone, but it's obvious something amazing has happened. And then we break for the week, weekend, and they go home and wherever they're doing and come back. And Monday morning, they look nearly as bad as they did the previous Monday morning. Well, that's annoying. <laughs> I don't like starting over every Monday. Huh? Yeah. And I know this can't be God. And I saw this too many times. And so at one point I got to seeking the Lord extra about it and praying and fasting some. Lord, what is going on here? I know you don't fail. I know your word's not failing. What, what's going on? I know real faith doesn't fail. What is happening here? And I didn't see it the first day or two, or a week or two, but eventually the Lord began to open my eyes, help me to see it. And I don't mean I heard a voice, but he, he caused me to understand. 
He said, son, while they're with you, those three or four hours a day, every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and, and there, uh, a lot of them came from their homes or towns, and, and even when they're not with you, they're reading the Word, and they're praying in the Spirit, and they're worshiping God, and they, and they get up in the morning, and come back, and get fed with the Word, and fed, and then they go back. But when they left and went back home, even a lot of their own family, ask them eight, nine times a day, how do you feel? Now, don't tell me all that faith stuff. How do you really feel? How are you really doing? He said, while they're with, with you and they're thinking on what I said, they were connected to life. But then they unhooked, they, they disconnected and hooked up to death to be Carnally minded is what? Yeah. When you're thinking on the wrong things, you're connecting yourself to death mm -hmm. so that death can flow in you. When your mind is on the right thing, it's life and it's peace. And this doesn't take some rare revelation. If you've, if you've had a bunch of, uh, of death and torment and vexation, you hadn't had your mind stayed on him. Because if you'll keep your mind stayed on him, what does Isaiah say? He will keep you, keep you, keep you in perfect peace. And I saw, uh, Rob, come, come up here and help me out just a minute. I, I saw this in my spirit with these individuals. Um, Gary, you come up here too. I need, I need uh, this, this Gary. Thank you, Gary. He's ready too. Come on up here. Stand on this side. Uh, I saw this individual that uh, they would, it's like they would turn and think about, let's let uh, Rob represent the Lord. I'm sorry, Gary. <laughs> and they came in all, all down and, 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 but if they would turn their mind on him and what he's saying, and, and it, it, they would touch him. And life would start flowing into them, and man, they'd just, they'd just begin to come up. It might not have happened all in a day or two, or even in a week, but, but life would just keep flowing into them. Just keep coming up, just keep coming up. But then, if they quit thinking about what he said, by stripes are healed, with long life he'll satisfy them, and they start thinking about the bad report, and they start thinking about how they feel and, and what happened to Aunt Mildred and, and Uncle Joe and, and how Aunt Susie didn't make it and, and what they don't understand. It's just like this. It's like the life begin to come out of them and death begin to come. They just begin to be drained and pulled down. And then they'd come back to healing school and they'd disconnect and they'd hook back up to that and they'd begin to blossom again. They'd begin to come up. Can you see this? Thanks, guys. It, to be spiritually minded connects you to life. And life flows into your spirit and into your mind and into your body and into your life. But to be carnally minded is death. And death will flow into you in your spirit and your, your mind, your soul, your body. In Matthew 18, what we're emphasizing, thoughts are spiritual. They're not natural. You can't touch a thought. You can't smell a thought. You can't feel a thought. It's spiritual. Where did it come from? Well, it came from a spiritual source, didn't it? It came from an evil source or it came from a good source. Should we think on thoughts that came from evil? Should we identify a thought and its source before we meditate on it and dwell on it and talk about it all day and night? Yes. And this has been the issue. Folks thinking, well, you know, as long as I don't act on it, if I'm just thinking about it, I'm not going to do it. You're already doing something spiritual and real. 
when you're thinking on something. And what's happening is we are connecting with spirits. We are touching something and letting it touch us. Just as real as a hand touching somebody or letting them touch you. In Matthew 18 and 18. He said, Verily I say to you, whatsoever you shall bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Should we bind up and cast down some thoughts? And should we should we allow the the good ones to come in? And verse 19, again I say to you that if two of you shall agree on earth, notice these next two words. As what? Now he's not talking about physically touching something. Agree on earth as what? Touching Touching anything that they shall ask. When you and I get in faith and our mind is on the same thing and we ask the same thing and our faith is on the same thing, this says we touch it. We touch it. As touching anything they shall ask, it shall be done. We touch something. Something happened. It set things in motion. Things changed. Something was done. Right? We touched something. Spiritual things are real. Spiritual things are real. When you set your mind on something, you open your spirit up to it. And you you reach out to touch it and you allow it in to touch you. If it's good, that's good. If it's bad, it's defiling and death dealing. And there is no such thing as it not having any effect to meditate and dwell on. So even if you hide it from other people, if you go around thinking about it all the time, you're touching it. And it's touching you. And it's changing you. You can only hide it for so long. And if we're touching and thinking on something bad, it's bad. But if we got our mind on Him, and we're thinking what He told us, hallelujah, hallelujah, then it's transforming us on the inside. And even though everybody might not see it, you can't hide it forever. Uh (laughs) You're going to begin to act like the master and talk like the master. It's going to begin to come out. People are going to look at you and go, wow, where'd that come from? And it's good. And it came from you being changed inside. And where it began was either last week or last month or five years ago, a thought from God came into you and you didn't just let it pass through, you grabbed it. And you said, this is precious. I'm going to just think on this all day. (laughs) This makes me smile. (laughs) When I think about this, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. See, if we, if we thought about that enough, hmm, if we thought about that, I'm sorry, excuse me, if we thought about that enough, then if anything from the outside tried to conform us and tell us we couldn't do it, we'd look at them like they'd cussed or were nuts. We'd think, huh? I can do all things. It has made you into somebody that can. Come on, do you see that? And you will just stay after it until you do. If it takes a year or 10, if we have to move mountains and build bridges and cross oceans, you'll do it. But, if you're quick to go, well, you know, they, know, they haven't been able to do it. And I guess not. I guess that's just reasonable. I mean, who am I? 
That means you, your mind has not been renewed. So you think like the unsaved people that don't even know God. You think just like them. Even though you're born again, and if you died, go straight to be with Jesus, in your mind, you think just like the unsaved world. And so you have no power to do things beyond what they can do. He went on to say, Two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. Do you know this same, this same word, uh, I'm, if I'm pronouncing it right, it's the word we get our word symphony from, to agree together, to harmonize. This is exactly what Ananias and Sapphira did. The word is used in the Greek. They agreed together to lie. They touched the wrong thing. And the Spirit of God through Peter looked at them and said, Satan has filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost. He said, you didn't lie to men. You lied in God's face. You got up in God's face and lied to him in his church in front of everybody. Man, they fell dead right there on the spot. One after another. Did something touch them? Did they let something get into them? And see, they were, I don't know if they were sitting around the house talking about it, looking at the, uh, the money and how much they got for the sale of the land. And they got on the same page and they agreed together that this is how they're going to go. And they, they opened up their spirit to the devil. What, what else could they have done? The thought came up. If they were both right like they should have been, even if the devil brought the thought to each one of them individually, they'd have shut that thing down in a millisecond and they'd have never discussed it. It would never even came up. But if one of them had been weak and brought it up to the other, they'd have said, are you kidding me? No. We're not going to go tell a lie in the church. And they would have shut it down. And they wouldn't have perished like that. Mm. To be carnally minded is death. death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. peace. If we're not experiencing an ever increasing flow of life and peace, it's obvious what the problem is. We have been letting our mind go to some wrong places. Yeah. We have been dwelling on wrong things. We've been listening and thinking and talking about wrong thoughts. Right. And it's ministering death to us. Keep reading. Any two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything they shall ask. It will be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Do you see verse 20 start with, with the word for? That means it's connected to what he just got through saying about touching and agreeing. For why would it be done for us of our Father which is in heaven? Because when you and I grab hands or we don't or we just agree, but our mind is on the same page and we're sharing the same thoughts and our thoughts are believing God and reaching out and we say in the name of Jesus, He's there. We're touching Him. He's touching us. Come on, are you listening? We're touching Him. Oh, the devil doesn't want us to know this. He doesn't want us to understand this. He wants to try to confuse us and, and complicate it and keep us wrong. But friend, you get a hold of this and, and you begin to practice controlling your mind and focusing your thoughts and being protective of your mind, not letting yourself think wrong things. You will develop in this and you'll learn how no matter what's going on, I mean it can be a hurricane around you and you'll learn how to set your mind on God and immediately open your spirit up to him and touch him. Just like that. He's there. You're there and you're aware of him. You're touching him and he's touching you. And life flows out of him. Light flows out of him. Wisdom flows out of him. Direction flows out of him. But if the devil, if you listen to him, he will bring you to all oh, and even use the name of the Lord in vain. Oh my God, what are we going to do? That thought didn't come from God. And why, where is this going to come from? How in the world will we ever get by this? And, 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 and what in the world? And, and, and those thoughts sit you into a spin. 
and you're trembling and you're shaking and, and fear, you're touching something else. Come on, are you? It's no wonder people shake and tremble like they do in fear because I'm convinced if our eyes could be open and we could see what we're touching, we'd take 35 showers. <laughs> Come on, are you listening to me? And we'd never do it again. Some folks that have felt sorry for themselves and gone crawled up in the bed and and laid there and pined. And if they could see what's laying up in the bed with them, <laughs> what they are intimate with, what they are letting inside their mind. It's, it's not, I mean, touching your skin. We're not talking about that. We're talking about touching you inside you. And we don't have to do it. I said, we don't have to do it. We do not have to do it. When these ungodly, unbelieving, death-filled, fear-filled thoughts come to us, the first moment we're aware of them, we got the power, we got the ability to grab them and to cast them. That's a strong word. Cast them down. And say, so I refuse to think that that's a lie, that's not true, you cannot touch me, and then you start speaking the Word of God. And that puts his thoughts right back in your mind. Come on, are you listening? And if you'll keep your mind stayed on him, he will keep you in perfect peace. Why would you be having perfect, total, complete peace all the time? Because you're touching the Prince of Peace. You're in contact with him. You're touching him. And he's touching you. And that's why that peace is just flowing in you and around you and filling up your house. Glory to God. Stand on your feet, everybody. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let me lead you in this prayer. Release your faith. Father God, I ask you, Alert me to wrong thoughts, defiling, death-ministering thoughts, thoughts that didn't come from you, ungodly, fearful, unbelieving thoughts. Alert me when they come. Help me to recognize them immediately. And by your grace, I'll cast them down. I'll refuse to think about them, talk about them. I choose your thoughts. I choose your words. I choose to meditate in what you said night and day. Thank you for keeping me in perfect peace and filling me with the life of God. Oh, hallelujah. Just praise Him some more. Don't think about your needs, your problems, your mistakes, your failures. Think about Him. Think about His love. Think about His mercy. Think about His grace. Think about his goodness. Yes, I am.